while they're setting up the chairs. It's and my colleagues are coming up on stage. It's great to be here this afternoon on this lovely day. Look forward to shifting a little bit in as to, as Gordon said, this conversation about human capital. Um, and as the chairs are coming up, I'll introduce each of our guests as they sit down. But what we want to be doing in this next 45 minutes or so is to be talking about perhaps the most important element of the urban system and an infrastructure that in many ways is as creaky and challenged as our physical infrastructure, and that is the human capital infrastructure. I'm gonna come back in a moment and frame that conversation for us to start the dialogue, but let me first introduce our guests. From my left to my right, your right to your left, I guess, is uh, Gene Dunn from Cisco. Their full bios are in the, um, in the speaker's bio, so I'm not gonna do a big, long introduction, but Jean is right in the middle of all of these issues in her role at Cisco. Next to her is Tammy Johns. Tammy is the founder and CEO of skills.com, which she'll tell you a little bit more about and when she speaks, and was for many years at Manpower, where she saw this, these issues all around the globe. And next to her is Martin Scalione. Martin is the CEO of an amazing not-for-profit that is trying to address the skills gap, among other things, called the Hope Street Group, and he'll give us a little bit of a, a perspective on things that he sees at the leading edge of innovation between sectors. So with that, let me sit down and start the conversation. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Um, so a as uh, Gordon said, this, what in some people think of as the soft infrastructure is crucial to enabling all of the rest of infrastructure to work in our, in our cities and, and regions around the world. Uh, even in the United States at a moment where it feels like we're in, in an important part of the recovery and, and unemployment levels are down in the 5% range and in places like where we're sitting today, in San Francisco it's under three, there still is a large number of people who are not connected to the workforce in the way they need to be and there are a large number of employers who still have substantial gaps that they can't seem to fill no matter what they do. This is in an environment where the economy is good. What happens if it goes sideways again? Or should I say when it goes sideways again? Mm -hmm. And what happens as we think about the world that is no longer predictable and the jobs that we're talking about today that we're having people heading through our educational systems and our workforce systems are gonna be radically different in five to 10 years? What's gonna to happen to the traditional educational institutions, particularly our post-secondary and skills training institutions? What's gonna to happen to the role that employers play in thinking about what it is that they're looking for in potential workers and how do they signal that to the marketplace and to the institutions providing those skills? What role will technology and innovation play both in the technology itself and in the users of that technology, whether it's for-profit, not-for-profit institutions, businesses, education institutions. And importantly, what's the role of an individual in managing their own portfolio of skills and thinking about their, those assets as theirs that need to be investing, not just when you're, before you enter the workforce for the first time, but throughout your life. So we're gonna cover all of those in 40 minutes and have answers to each one of them, and you're gonna come away crystal clear, I promise. <laughs> so um, with that, let me, let me uh, start with, with Jean. And Jean, you're both a substantial employer. Yes. Um, you, you are at the cutting edge of how you attract and get some of the most in-demand talent around the world. And you're also in a, in, a, in a space where you're providing really interesting technology to this whole world. So let me just ask you, and from your, your vantage point, from what you see, um, you know, wh where, where's this going? What's the, what's the nature of the game that we're, we're talking about? Well, it, it, it's very interesting. You know, um, Cisco, as you all know, is um, you know, the foundation for the internet and really enabled the internet to happen more than 25 years ago. And when you're, in the middle of actually creating a new industry, you've got to take great responsibility for creating the talent pool for that industry. And so, you know, when we first got started, um, you know, we looked around and said, okay, so where's the talent? Where, you know, where are the people that we're going to be able to bring in that are going to help us actually build the internet to build these systems across the globe? And uh, what was very clear is that if we didn't build it, it wouldn't happen. 
So we set out to do a couple of different things, and I'll, I'll talk about that first as an example, but then I'll talk about where we are today and what needs to happen on top of that. Uh, so the first thing we said was, okay, in order for us to create the kind of skills we needed, nobody in the schools could really do this quite yet. And uh, so we set up to define very specific um, certification programs and education programs. Uh, we called it the Cisco Certification Program and Networking Academy. For those of you that understand the school systems, you'll know that Networking Academies are you know, essentially our way of reaching out to universities and high schools and providing them curricula to uh, be able to skill up and train the next generation of internet uh, people. And so we did that you know, well over uh, 20 years ago. We started that journey. And the goal then was you know, we need to create a number of people to set the, set the context and be able to fuel both our customer and our partner journey through this whole transition. Um, so they weren't necessarily just for Cisco. Cisco was about 1% of that population. It was really about the 99% of the population of our customers and partners. Uh, but the interesting thing is, you know, once we had the structure in place, it was good, but we didn't have the scale. And so to build the scale, um, about 10 years ago, we decided to create what I guess has been written up now as the first social learning platform out there in the industry. And the goal of that was to um, be able to open up the gates, to remove the barriers of place, space, and time to education and allow anyone into uh, these networking careers if they chose to do it. Of course, the other challenge for this is, uh, is t telling people what is out there, telling them about these jobs, what they look like, getting them to connect with people that are in the industry that already know these things, and uh, being able to inspire them to, uh, to come forward and start their career in, an, in, in a new area, a new space. So now fast forward, uh, you know, now we've, we've um, you know, put that in high gear. Uh, we've generated um, two, two and a half uh, million people through this program. So we've been able to create, if you will, the workforce that is setting up the industry for the internet. And as I look forward into what's the next generation of the internet, the digital landscape, as businesses now need to uh, think about how they reinvent themselves, how cities need to connect in new and different ways and drive intelligent transportation systems and sustainable um, systems for, you know, for the planet. Um, we know that there's a huge shortage of skills once again. And it's going to be incredibly important for industry and cities and nonprofits to work together um, along with education to do this. Education alone will not solve this problem. We know this for sure. Yeah. We know this for sure. And um, the other big change that's going to happen, um, we're going to have to go from buyers of talent to builders of talent. Every organization is going to have to figure out how they're going to do this. And you can't do it alone. Um, so one of the things that we did, um, we started this year actually, was the IoT um, Talent Consortium. And that's something that um, I chair and um, we founded just about three months ago. And we invite all of you to take a look at this and see if you want to join. But essentially what we're doing is we're bringing together all industries that are in this new industrial internet, this new smart city um, forum, to be able to come forward, help us decide and look at what jobs need to be created in this new space. Because I guarantee you there's at least 30 new jobs that are being created as we speak um, with new types of skills and we haven't seen before. And, and so to do this properly, we need to take an industry perspective, and we need to be able to bring that intelligence back into the community and then allow the world to come and meet that need. Um, so that is what we're doing right now. The uh, Internet of Things uh, will form, and the, the talent consortium that was a natural result of that uh, is our, our new level uh, of engaging the greater community into this effort, because it's bigger than Cisco. It's, it is going to take industries from all over the place, educators from all over the place, cities, government uh, to participate, and of course, educators at large. That's fantastic. It's wonderful to hear both the history of how you got engaged yeah. and how it's going to continue to need to be reinvented because technology is continuing to move and That's right. the jobs that are going to yeah. be. And the gaps are in the millions. We're not talking about small right. talent gaps. We're talking about a million, per, just in cybersecurity alone, a million people are needed today. Mm -hmm. And we don't have that. And in order for infrastructure to connect securely, um, we need to have this kind of talent. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, well, I'm going to come back to talk to you about how you get other businesses to do to think the way you're thinking. But um, so, Tammy, um, 
you've been involved in this world for your entire career, yep. and you're also an entrepreneur who who thought about are there are there ways that technology and new ways of delivering can can work. By the way, I love the name skills.com. Is that like the perfect name <laughs> for a startup? So well, tell us a little bit about how you think about this problem and what, what you think the opportunities are. Sure. So um, as Lenny, you mentioned, I started a Manpower Group 20-some um, years ago, um, my career in this space. So really had the opportunity to look at very local labor markets and understand the skills challenge. Um, and then at the end of my career at Manpower Group, I was focused on how technology might change how people work, but also how they get skilled, um, which led me to skills.com. Because one of my, so skills.com, um, if you haven't seen it yet, it launched April 24th, and it is a platform, a community, and a mobile app that is focused on helping capture and build the world's practical skills and share them for free. So what we're asking people, so what we fundamentally believe is that the knowledge and skills that are needed in the workplace today are in the workplace. People possess that knowledge. We just need to unlock the, the barriers that exist, be it cost barriers and time barriers, to make that knowledge available. So we ask people to um, film a five-minute video about their skills and share them with the world. And the key thing that happens then is that people can, you know, in a situation when they need to understand what's, you know, how to do something, how to solve a problem, they can access skills.com and immediately get some information. But the more interesting part of skills.com is it allows people to also learn and then film their own video and share their own and, and, and get feedback about the skills. So it doesn't fight with schools. As, as Jean, you said, schools can only do so much. And what we need is you know, education and academics on one side and then situa situational learning on the other that gives people the access to the knowledge what, that they need when they need it. Because there's no way that you can build curriculums in enough time for the pace of change to meet the skills demand. And if it's you know, happening now at the pace it is, you know, hang on, because it's just right. going to get a, a, lot, a lot more. And it's not skills.com. So Cisco was one of the first learning, uh, social learning platforms. There's a whole bunch of them out there focused on lots of different skills, and, and they have different models, and they all serve you know, different skill sets. But fundamentally, what they do is, you know, in the same way that people are sharing their homes on Airbnb and sharing their cars like in Zipcar, it's sharing skills and knowledge so that people can get prepared and, and meet the demands of the new pace of the workforce. Interesting. And I know you've done a fair amount of research and writing on what kinds of skills are we talking about. Yeah. So what are some examples of the types of skills that can be demonstrated that way and are, gonna, are very much in demand and not necessarily easily assessed otherwise? Yeah, the, the skills in, in preparing for skills.com, uh, you know, in, in really thinking what's missing in the market, what's the space that we could serve, um, I looked at Burning Glass, a labor market an, uh, an analytics firm, looked at their data, and it's job posting data. They have 20 million job postings on average a year. And I looked at two consecutive years across all industries. So I wasn't looking for the skills that were most in demand in an industry. I was looking at the skills that were most in demand across all industries. And in the skills that came up consistently in 45%, so almost 10 million of those job postings, were communication, customer service, sales, organization, financial literacy, um, and, and technology skills, but not in the software development, and they are definitely in demand, but in the fix and repair, there's something new that came out. How do I learn how to do the next evolution of that? Hmm, that's great. Those don't sound like things that you get degrees in. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, and the, the interesting thing about those skills is that they're skills that are mastered. The more you present, the better you get at it. And, and so by even being able to use technology and video-based technology, to learn how to do those things and to learn them from other people, you just get yeah. simply better at it. And, and the reality of the job situation today is that even non-technical jobs, we're, we're, we're 
assuming that about 50% of jobs are going to need a serious amount of technology literacy Absolutely. in how to use the tools to be able to actually just go to work and do your job. Absolutely. So, um, so it's really critical that you have some things out there that show people in a practical manner how to do that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great. So Martin, let me bring you into this conversation. Yeah. So you're, first of all, I want you to explain what Hope Street Group is and Absolutely. what you're doing yeah. more eloquently than I did. But more particularly, I want you to talk a little bit about how you see this ecosystem and what the, in, in some ways, the market failure that's not working here as well as we might like. What's, what's gonna be necessary to fix that? Yeah, thank you, Lenny. I'll start with a couple of pieces. One, just to put some evidence around, you know, what we're seeing here in America today. I don't know if you realize this, we have 5.8 million jobs open in America today. That's a lot. That's a, that, in fact, that's more jobs open in America today than uh, since 2000, when we started counting the number as a, as a country. Uh, interestingly enough, and this may frighten you, there's 982,000 jobs open in the healthcare sector. And those are not what we would call professional or licensed jobs. Those would be what we would consider staffing jobs, nutritionists, medical assistants. So there's, a, there's, there's something going on here in our country, and this is what we try and do at Hope Street Group, is we try and figure out what really is going on. We see symptoms. People talk about a skills gap. We see that and say, well, what's the root cause for the skills gap? That, that's really what Hope Street Group is all about, is precision problem identification. And then what we do is we gather thought leaders from all across uh, the nation, you know, from multiple industries, diverse points of view, and put them around the table to ideate around the solution. Mm -hmm. If you know what the problem is, it's a lot easier to create the solution. And we're not the ones that are going to create it at Hope Street Group. Um, you know, we're a small not-for-profit. I, I think we punch very much above our weight <laughs> on one hand. But it, the reason we're able to do so is because we're able to bring great thought leaders around the solution to that problem that we've identified. In, in the space of work, what we've identified today is less about the skills gap and more about the signals that are being shot across the bow. No one knows more about occupations than the employer, <laughs> right? And unfortunately, we don't engage them as much as we probably should. Or oftentimes what we do is we ask employers to do things that may not yield the type of results that are really aligned to either their mission, their goals, or perhaps you know, maybe even to their time allocations. So we've got to make it easier for employers to, 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 to lend a hand in here. And if they know more about occupations, I mean, what are we talking about? We're talking about knowledge, skills, abilities, behaviors. And if we can get a clearer identification of what those may be, and also a key element here, the, the, the rapid fire change inside of a job. As technology gets infused across industries, new processes come to be, these jobs change. That's right. yeah. And they change quickly. And our education system, good or bad, not here to make judgment on that, is not keeping pace with those changes. So as we're bringing sources of, uh, of people forward for work, oftentimes they just don't have the skills. We may see an academic proxy or something that says they have the skill, but the reality is the job has changed so fast that when they show up, there's a disconnect. Right. And so th this is really the center of our attention today. Um, and we believe, given the world technology that exists today, actually creating signals both from the occupational side and then also from the individual side, there can be tremendous improvement in our system going forward. So that's what we're driving towards, Lenny. That's fantastic. So um, feel free to talk, yeah. re react to that. But Gene, I want you to comment for a minute about how, how practically do you, as an employer, do you engage in these issues? I mean, you're doing it through building something, yeah. but you, you know, you, you're hiring people everywhere that's and right. you're dealing with thousands of institutions. How do you actually do that? <laughs> yeah, and that's, that's the challenge is that, um, you know, what, one of the things we recognize is a large company who, who believes that the internet and education are the great leveling fields. Mm -hmm. uh, we have invested a lot in this and we have always believed that this is a platform we should be strong in. And so we don't expect everybody to do exactly what we're doing, but what we're hoping to do through the IoT Talent Consortium is actually bring forward um, a capability that allows every employer to engage in the same way we have and leverage all the assets that we've constructed over the many years. 
uh, and as well as the best practices. So the idea is to bring together really all the thought leaders and the people that are already doing great, like you know, organizations yeah. like yours that are already doing great, great work here, <laughs> with um, you know platforms and models to to allow them to um, create, if you will, talent exchanges. Um, by creating first and foremost the standards for the job. It all goes back to what employers need for the skills in the job today. And so that's exactly what the talent construction is all about. It's actually creating those standards with the employers themselves. So that's why when we put this forum together, we went after all the big employers, if you will, of the Internet of Things. Um, in, whether it's in the industrial area or you know in cities, we're, we're essentially going after each and every one of these areas to get them to help us standardize on those jobs. Because there are two things that are happening in the Internet of Things. One is the internet. The other thing is the process that already exists in that industry. And so you have to bring those two worlds together in a unified manner for that to work. And the jobs and skills change. And they have their own ecosystems. Each one of these industries have their own ecosystems that you have to be able to reach into. So by connecting these things together, uh, we feel that we are going to be able to create another million people uh, in, in this new space to try to deal with some of the cybersecurity mm -hmm. talent that's missing, deal with some of the digital marketing skills that mm -hmm. are missing, the data analyst skills yeah. that are missing, and many others that we feel are sort of the top trending uh, things of today. And of course, um, you know, most of that's going to come from outside of the school system. It's going to come from really um, the private sector uh, in many areas. Okay. And I was just going to say, I hope when you create those standards that they're not so rigid yeah. that outside of the box ways of developing and gaining new skills can still be um, considered so that you know people who um, maybe didn't go to get finish the college or didn't have the advantage Absolutely. of working up through an organization can yep. still somehow get engaged. And that is actually the beauty behind the model that yep. we put in place years ago was that we actually did care whether you had any kind of degree awesome. at all. You could come in. In fact, many of our best success stories yep. were from people who came from very poor backgrounds, mm -hmm. never went to college, yep. went to high school, yep. but had a capacity to learn, had a desire to learn, yep. and, and just simply decided to start studying online and reading books and talking to people that were in yep. the industry and and you know renting some some equipment here and there you know from people borrowing stuff from yep. other people to learn people just were very motivated um, so the only thing that we do is create the standard and we provide a lot of material that can be exposed in many different ways yep, right. and many different sources because the whole idea is to democratize yep. education and make it accessible to everyone that is the whole idea perfect you, you know I want to comment on that I think that's a really rich thought and I, I, I should again put a little context you know this idea of measuring and assessing in traditional manner mm. is really a method to select people out yeah. uh, unfortunately and that's happening and we're in the midst of a consumer revolution in our country right we see it in multiple industries we haven't quite seen that in the workforce you know, where the individual actually is empowered as to where they're now making informed decisions and choices about what they want to do with their career. If you went out to many people and just surveyed and, you know, young people, transition workers, it doesn't matter, and asked them, what skills do you need to have the job you want? You would not get a good answer to that question. They, they don't know. Well, I think we have an obligation to make that more readily available. Right. That's right. right. And so in doing so, we're going to empower that dynamic that needs to occur. That's both good for the individual and both good for the occupation Absolutely. side. And you know, speaking of measurement, you know, setting aside the multiple choice bubble chart, you know, that we <laughs> that we see. And I know that because I, I when I did my work at ACT, I know yeah. that quite well. There are more than just a, you know two indicators of success in a right. job, right? What about performance? What about demonstration? What about reputation? What about experiential Absolutely. learning? Yeah. All of it. You know, you know, cognitions, of course, behaviors, of course, interest, of course social culture, all of the things. What's the composite of the person the same way we are trying to understand the composite of the job? Mm -hmm. And if we were able to get that to a better level of understanding and utilize technology to exchange that data, skills.com as an example, <laughs> then suddenly we're going to have a better exchange and I yeah. think we're going to have a, a, a better market that's working in a, in a more yeah. profound yeah, way. Yeah, and in fact, industry is moving to this model because yep. industry is starting to say, I am very willing to use badges, experience, and other things yes to measure the talent yeah. coming in the door versus using education as right. a method. Because absolutely, education does sort 
quite heavily at the beginning right. and yes. does leave a lot of people behind. Right. And think how empowered that individual now becomes because they actually, you know, I know how to weld, yes. by the way, I do. I literally know, my grandfather was an Italian immigrant and he taught me how to weld. I don't have a certificate, yeah. but I can lay a bead and I know how to read yeah. a blueprint. There's how a to... huge demand for that skill. It really is. Right. <laughs> right. Then there's, there's a huge demand. The thing about right. how many people do know how to weld and acquired that skill but didn't go through the traditional settings yeah. and have their certificate or credential to demonstrate that. Right. And, then, and it's true in many industries. That's right. And, and the best teaching, too, comes from honestly from experts you know, to, mm -hmm. to the cause that you're trying to represent right. here. One of the things that we found when we stood up Cisco Learning Network, which was yeah. our social site, yeah. we stood it up as much things to get it started. So we built it, we you know, drew people to it, yeah. we recruited people into it because people didn't know what it was all, all about. And then the second thing we did is we allowed the community to own it back. Mm -hmm. And once we did that, okay. they started contributing all this really great information, this rich tutorials, right. these, these study groups, all of these things that would help other people learn. And, and, the, and the interesting thing is communities do want to get back, particularly if they've had a successful experience through their own career right. journey. So, right. yeah, so just providing places for people to collect this information and to congregate right. and to share is, is a big step up. So, Tammy, what's the role of the individual in this world going forward. You, you know, by definition, the person owns their skills, right. but they're not very transparent or they don't actually have a way to communicate those as effectively as you might want. What, what, what's, what, if you're talking about mm -hmm. to your children or to the next right. folks, well, how do they, are they gonna be thinking about this? Well, I think that you know, the, the, the responsibility is, is, and it's not just for children, it's for all of us that are in the labor market is, to create a portfolio, to really understand um, the labor market, which is tricky in itself because it's not clear at all, you know, the, where those, you know, five million jobs are. Tell me what they are. It's hard to find exactly what skills are necessary. But what we're hoping is that, that individuals and certainly companies play a key role as, as well as um, you know, nonprofit organizations and governments and schools to bring this information forward and then for people to understand that they own the responsibility of developing skills to sit back and expect that your employer is going to do it for you or that you're going to ride on that, you know, four-year degree if you had a four-year degree that that's gonna last you, it doesn't even last you any longer into the labor market. So really taking the responsibility of building skills, but also what I'm really hoping um, is that people will take responsibilities as communities, whether it be you know, a, an industry community or a city itself to say, I owe a responsibility to help people learn something new. And, and I would really challenge, especially cities, to say, yes. what can I do to help people in my city learn. Yeah. As an employer, the reason why we are in certain cities and environments, we choose to those locations. Right. And we choose those locations based on whether or not we have access to talent. Right. Of course, there have right. to be other business, you know, um, friendly things going on, but sure. at the end of the day, if we don't have access to talent, we can't even we can't even begin to consider putting a location right. there. So we're just about at the end of, my, of our time. I'd love to just give each of you the, the rapid fire, one final thought mm -hmm. on this topic that you want to make sure the audience goes away with. And I'm going to let you go last. So we'll start down here, Martin. So you're. Yeah, a thought that went through my head. You know, technology has done a wonderful job of getting to identification of skills better than any other industry. And I don't know why. I, my, my conclusion is that, I say I don't know why, but I, I think it's because they weren't burdened by the legacies of some of the historical industries like manufacturing where I grew up or we kind of said this is the way it has to be. And it would seem to me that we need to break out of this cycle that exists in these other industries, uh, whether it be health, manufacturing, logistics, et cetera, in terms of these traditional ways of selecting and hiring and sourcing talent. It's time to bust away from that and maybe use the technology industry as a model for how it might be done differently. Okay, bust out of the hiring models. Yep, yep, okay, yep. Tammy? Um, I, I would say, you know, really, I, I would, it's not just technology, even though I have represented kind of a technology platform and approach, is what can each one of us do to help somebody learn? It, especially people who are in the first decade of their career, because they do not have the advantage that many of us had, which was mentorship and help 
throughout our career. So really pause when you see that person who looks scared and doesn't have the skills and is maybe afraid to ask what you just asked them to do. Stop and say, how can I help them be better performers? That's great. So bring back apprenticeship, not appre the Apprentice TV show, but real. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Jean? Yes. Uh, yeah, and I'd say the last thing is there's hope for everyone in this new market. Mm -hmm. if, if someone has great raw talent, they can learn anything. That's one Absolutely. thing we've discovered through our whole process. It doesn't really matter your education background. It really depends on what's inside and you yeah. know your ability to learn yeah. and your passion for learning. And if you really, really want to do something, you can learn it. Um, yeah. So um, you know, it doesn't matter. You know, for cities out there that don't have a lot of local colleges that are pumping out uh, engineering talent or the kind of talent you need, you can still grow it and skill skill it up yourself. That's not really an inhibitor. That's but. great. Well, bust open the hiring process. Apprentice more and grow your own. Yes. So, great. Well, please join me in thanking our panel for an interesting Thank conversation. Thank you very much, Gene, Tammy, and Mark.